I'd like to talk today about the merits of data-driven systems, how they're realized in production systems, and some tools and techniques to aid in creating data-driven systems. And this is really a hodgepodge of topics and themes that stretch across a lot of previous talks, some at other conferences, some at previous conges. And it, you know, those topics, they're gonna be things like um, uh, DSLs and preferring data over functions over macros. And we're gonna be talking a lot about declarative systems and declarative programming. And, and, and how that declarative programming actually gets realized in Clojure. And to get started, I'd like to talk about the value of values. You know, a lot of people have previously talked about data all the things, but what they often describe are the merits of programming with values. And I think those are good merits. They're certainly worth sharing, and they're definitely worth repeating again and again and again, but I wanna talk about something a little more. I wanna talk about systems that are captured in data, entire systems that express their components or their interactions or their behaviors or, or, or maybe all of the above in data. And this is really a spectrum, right? At, at one end of the spectrum, we have systems that capture absolutely nothing in data. And maybe you interact with those systems using function calls or you know, a DSL that's backed by macros. And way at the other end of the spectrum are systems that are fully declarative through data. And you interact with those systems using data structures or the values in your programming language. And I want to explore that spectrum. I, I want to think about the outcomes and the conclusions we can make as we travel towards that data-driven side. And you know, mostly this talk is really about what's next. If you're already programming with values, if you're on this path of programming with values, that path has to go somewhere. Certainly programming with values is not the end of that path, it's merely the beginning. And so you know, what's next on this path? Where else does this path actually lead to? And to motivate all this stuff, I'd like to talk specifically about consumer reports. Now, before I go on, I'd like to thank David Rubini and Jonah Benton uh, for allowing me to explore these topics and build the projects I'm about to share with you today. They're fantastic individuals. Consumer Reports is an absolutely fantastic company. There are Consumer Reports employees here in the crowd. Talk to them, you know, find out the exciting things they're building, the cool tools they're using. It will definitely be worth your time. You know, Consumer Reports is in this process of transforming themselves into a digital-first, consumer-focused company. And that's a transition a lot of other companies are trying to make right now as well. You know, but what does that really mean? It's sort of buzzwordy, right? Well, let me give you an example. Winter is just around the corner, and for me, that means a lot of snow. I live in New Hampshire. And last winter, all I had was a shovel, and it was terrible, and I'm pretty much done using a shovel for the rest of my life. So this year, I am determined to get a snowblower. I will definitely have a snowblower by next weekend. You know, so maybe I go to my local hardware store. For me, I think that's a Lowe's or a Home Depot or something like that. You know, and I go to the snowblowers, and in front of me, there are 10 snowblowers. And they all roughly look the same, right? They have the same general shape. They have the same general parts. Most of them are even the same color. You know, so what snowblower should I actually buy? I have no idea. Well, imagine I take out my smartphone, and I open up the Consumer Reports application, and you know, maybe I take a picture of all the snowblowers, or I, I scan the barcode of all, all the snowblowers, or maybe I just tell the Consumer Reports app what store I'm in, and it happens to know all of the inventory for that store. You know, and then I, you know, I say what I'm interested in and how often I'm going to use it, and you know, I live in New Hampshire, and that's a lot of snow, and all of a sudden, Consumer Reports app says, hey, this is the snowblower you need to buy, and guess what? It's on sale, and go ahead and buy it. Right, that is a digital first, consumer focused kind of application. It's delivering immediate value to me, the consumer. And it's using all of the assets that Consumer Reports has to do that. So this is the sort of transition that they're going through. In order to build those kinds of applications though, we need to fuse together a lot of streams of data. And some of that data you, know, you own, and some of the data you have to get from remote resources that you don't own. Right, who here builds HTTP services just to access data? Right, in the world of, right, there's a lot of hands. Right? So, in the world of this rich client application, so much work goes into building just these sort of simple data services. And that's really what I'm gonna start sharing with you today. I wanna share a story with you about building three projects around this theme, about building these kinds of applications. And the first project sort of shapes up and gets started like this. Consumer Reports wants to allow mobile and application developers to construct these kinds of applications, but they have no knowledge of back-end systems or you know, the minutia or the incidental complexities or the technologies or the techniques to actually build these back-end back services. Nonetheless, Consumer Reports says, 
they should be able to do this. You know, as they're building this app, they should say, uh-oh, you know, in order to do this, I need this data source. I need data that looks this way. I need to be able to access it like this. So they want to construct these prototypes without backend experience. They also want to free their data. They want to allow different teams to evolve the data model however they need to to build these kinds of products, to deliver this kind of functionality. You know, in the world of the relational DB, you know, maybe there's a, a data architect or a DBA or maybe a very small few of them, and they're sort of the gatekeepers of the data. And you can't go changing that data model all willy-nilly without breaking everybody's stuff, right? So Consumer Reports recognizes this, and they want to move into a different direction, a direction where you can evolve that data model. And they want to talk about producing these kinds of prototypes in terms of hours and not days or weeks. And this really speaks to you know, rapidly iterating, rapidly experimenting, and getting immediate feedback, finding that immediate value and sort of continuing on with that direction. You know, and when Consumer Reports recognizes that systems age and they evolve, and they can do so gracefully, and they want to end up with an architecture that can age and evolve and do so gracefully while achieving all these things. And this is sort of how the first project shapes up. These are the high-level goals, the dreams, if you will, for building this product. Now, let's go up a layer of abstraction here. Let's consider the hypernym. This is a great problem-solving technique, right? Consider the general case of glossing over all of these details. These are great goals to target. Companies from the smallest startup to the largest enterprise target at least one of these four goals. Like, who doesn't want to develop stuff in hours instead of days or weeks? I think that's everybody here, right? I'd rather work only hours than not days or weeks on something. You know, I, I would like to evolve my data however I need to to get the job done. Man, if my job was doing nothing but declarative programming and expressing the semantics or the intent of a service, I would, I would not have to do any programming whatsoever. I would just sort of magically create services all of the time. All right, so these are good goals to target. And so internalize that. You know, put yourself in the position of trying to build this problem. And how would you do it? How would you start to tackle this problem? How might you cut it up? You know, how, how might we build a system that you know, can declaratively express services or, or, or can evolve the data? And I really think we should start thinking holistically about problem domains. Consider all of the goals together and how they play off of each other. It's really more about the harmony here. A system is more than the sum of the components. It's about how, how all of those components will play off of each other. You know, so how might we do this? How might we do this all together? And let's really question our nouns. You know, as we're thinking through the design space here, and, and as the team was thinking through the design space, you know, we really started questioning our nouns. What do we really mean when we say service? What is a service? What are the properties of, of a service, the, the behaviors, the actions, the quality attributes? What does it mean to be a service? And can we draw a box around that? Can we constrain what it means to be a service? Because if we can, it's a much easier problem to solve. Uh, you, you know, at this stage, we were really imagining our ideal future. We were spending a lot of time in design imagining the ideal future. In the ideal future, these problems don't exist. We don't even think of them as problems, because in the ideal future, we're just building systems like this already. So imagine that ideal future. Figure out all of the parts that are missing and build your way back. That was sort of the mentality we had. So what was our I ideal feature? Well, we built a service that holds other services, right? And uh, we, we, we called it a container service. And those other services are purely declarative, described in data using Eden. They did describe the things that you would expect services to describe, things like schema and routes. And you know, a single service description was actually versioned. So, you know, a service could describe multiple versions of itself. Uh, we also constrained what it meant to be a service. For us, a service could only do five things. As we looked at the general case, we realized all of these services only do five things. They respond with static data. They redirect to another URL. They query the database and they return the results. They transact data into the database. Or they validate some data payload. You know, so you might say to the service, is this a valid US mailing address? And the service would come back and say, yes, it is, or no, it's not. Here are the fields that are wrong, and here's why they're wrong. You know, so we constrained a service to be that for this project. Now, in order to achieve this vision, we needed all subsystems to be able to be described in data as well. That's sort of a requirement here. So Pedestal and Datomic were natural choices for us. Pedestal is a set of 
uh, web libraries for building very robust, very fast and secure web services. And its main interaction point, the route definition, is purely data. It can be described only using data. So that was a natural fit here. We could just drop it right in and use it. And same thing with Datomic. Its main interaction points and it, its major components are all data described, schema, transactions, queries, all data. And so we use those technologies. And the master container service you know, took care of all the incidental complexities about building services. It normalized all the response formats. So the response formats were normalized across every service. That meant you know, composing services together was very natural. It was very fast to build these clients. It also took care of things like giving consistent error handling across all services. Basically, every low-level detail about building services was handled by the master container. The master container also allowed for live upserts. You could go ahead and evolve a single service description and continue to upsert service descriptions or versions of a service as the system was running. You know, and this is sort of what we ended up with. And let's just think about those four goals for a moment, real briefly. You know, is this system uh, declarative? Can we just describe the intent of a service? We definitely can, right? It's just sort of this data description. And uh, you know, can we evolve the data model? Well, you'll see in a bit that we definitely can. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> and uh, you know, can we do this in hours instead of days or weeks? Well, it's just a, a, a data file, right? It's just a piece of Eden. I can create a piece of Eden in definitely less than an hour. So creating a service takes less than an hour. You know, and can we evolve the system? Well, the master container allowed for live upserts, so we could evolve the system however we needed to. We could evolve it service by service or across all the services at once. And it evolved very gracefully. So let's take a look at what this might actually look like or you know, what we ended up building. And I understand this is very small. You're not meant to read any of this. But we call this thing vase because it's a very small container that sits on top of pedestal and is very limited in what it can hold. Now, let's dig into this and look at the structure a little bit more. At the very top of the service description is the service name. And this is the global identifier for a service. So it identifies it in, in a given container. After that was the schema definitions. The schema definitions could be you know, the standard atomic schema definitions, but VASE also had a, a shorthand in the form of a reader literal. And you could also talk about schema dependencies here. So different chunks of the schema could depend on you know, other chunks of the schema. And this meant you know, creating schema or, or sort of uh, attaching it or growing it was, was a very natural process. After that are the versions of the routes, the route definitions. And these are standard pedestal route definitions. So let's zoom in on one and see what it actually looks like. So here's the route definition for slash users. If you make a get request, it will result in a query on the, on the database, and the, the results of that query will be returned. And if you make a post request, it will transact new data into the database. And here you can see how we actually constrained what it meant to be a service. All of those five constraints are actually captured behind reader literals. And that's how we can compose these actions using data. We call them action literals. And we're going to talk about some conclusions of doing this in a little bit. After the route definitions were service properties, these are things like the HTTP headers you want to forward or the schemas that you depend on in this particular version of the API. And at the very bottom of this file is yet another version of the service. It's a very small version, version two. So let's talk about some conclusions about doing this, about capturing services as data. Well, on the surface, we're programming with values. And we get all of those great benefits of programming with values. It's very easy to generate and consume uh, these service descriptions in Clojure. And let's talk about more about those reader literals, right? The mechanism we use to constrain our service definition, right? the mechanism we use to box things in is the same exact mechanism that allows the entire system to be open for extension. You'll never get pigeonholed in, by using a system like this. Right? So that was a very powerful insight that we made. The entire system ends up being fully extensible through that same mechanism. And um, you know, when you capture the service de def definition as data, a lot of cool benefits sort of fall out of that. It can go anywhere data can go. You know, it can be stored in a file, read from a file, sent over the wire, stored in a cache, you know, stored in a CDN. It can be stored in a database. And in fact, let's talk about that last one a little bit more, storing it in a database. So vase already sits on top of Datomic. 
And we store all of the service descriptions inside of Datomic. And as live upserts are happening, we're actually storing that new version inside of Datomic. Which means if you look at the database as of some point in time, you see all of the services that existed at that point in time. Because the services are just data alongside of all of the other application data. So you get this full code and data rollback through your entire Datomic DB that you're sitting on top of. Now, Vase can be tossed a DB value. So you could roll back the DB to some point in time, get that DB value, and pass it back to Vase. And Vase will say, OK, well, I'm going to just run with this one now. So you got full code and data rollback. Think about how hard that is to do in the systems that you know, you're creating today outside of doing something declarative like this. It's a pretty difficult problem to do, to get exact point in time code and data rollback. You know, but what other things can you do once your uh, service description is captured in data? Well, you can query it. You, you can query and analyze it. You can use data log to enforce service-wide properties across the entire thing. So there's a lot of literature about using data log to enforce the presence or absence of properties and programs, but very little li literature in doing it at a systems-wide level or service-wide level. Now, when we originally designed this system, we thought, oh, yeah, you know, we'll be able to see what APIs actually change the most or what URLs change the most or how much churn happens in the schema. But we didn't quite realize how powerful that query piece could actually be. We could start saying things like, if I change this schema, what URLs are going to break? Think about how you do, do that in your systems today. If I go to your work on Monday, and I go and I change the data model, can you immediately tell me what systems I just broke? That comes down to program analysis. That's a pretty hard problem to solve, and it's, you know, it's not fun to try to solve it. And here it's just a datomic query. And we got there because we chose data first. You, know, you can also start to impose these business rules on your services, too. You can say, it should always be the case that a query only gets triggered from a get request. Queries should never be triggered for post or put or delete. How would you do that in your system today? How can you prove that to me today? Well, again, that's program analysis. But here, that's just a datomic query. It's a pretty simple datomic query to write as well. So this was a really powerful technique, a really powerful thing that you know, we didn't even understand how powerful it was. And like I said, we delivered all four of those goals, in addition to having all these cool aspects fall out of it being data. And when we delivered it to Consumer Reports, they said, this is awesome. You know, you solved all these things. You built this thing. I can iterate really fast. Awesome. And then very, very quickly said, but what about our data? You know, as awesome as the system is, it doesn't have all of the value we actually need it to have. We can't actually build anything with it unless we have our data. And so we began our second project. And our second project was a Datomic import project. We needed to get that data into those services somehow. And it needed to be data source agnostic. Some of this data came from JSON files, and some came from DBs, and so on. And so we built this data agnostic import tool. And that data agnostic piece was actually extensible through a multi-method. So you know, if you had a new uh, file type or, or data import source, you could go ahead and extend the system. And so we imported stuff from JSON files, XML files, SQL dumps, and live JDBC connections. And we used this multi-pass design. One pass through the data, the tool actually reflected the structure and type of the data. So it sort of discovered what it thought the schema should be. And it generated a schema on that first pass. And it generated it in a format that it could be dumped directly into a service description. So awesome, now I don't even have to write schema anymore. This is great. And then on a second pass, with a schema in hand now, it would actually do that import, that, that uh, reflection on the structure of the data and the type of the data. That was also a multi-method, right? So that was also fully extensible. You could teach the tool how to reflect new value types into schema or how to in interpret new structures of data. And all of the knobs to control the system were also data-driven. They're sort of declarative, just like the service properties were. So, th so this is pretty exciting. It's a pretty cool tool to use. And you know, we, we imported all of this Consumer Reports data. But what I find you know, astonishing is that to import all of the product data and all of the re review data for Consumer Reports took less than 30 seconds to get it into Datomic. So that, that meant that somebody completely new, an application developer or a mobile developer, could walk up to this system, in 30 seconds get all of the data, and then in less than an hour write a service description. That's crazy to think about. 30 seconds to get all of that data, less than an hour to build an entire service. 
So we delivered that to Consumer Reports, and they said, now this is awesome. And then very, very quickly said, but what about rich client apps? So you can see that it's very hard to please Consumer Reports. But <laughs> you know, we began our third project. And honestly, at this time, in the sort of the project life, life cycle, I'm pretty much ready to walk it in. You know, I'm pretty exhausted. I've thought pretty hard about all these other pieces, really focused on the design. I'm going to walk it in. I'm going to write just another ClojureScript application and say, you know, here's ClojureScript. It's pretty cool, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I have a very serious personality flaw. And that is if somebody has some expectation of me, you know, if somebody sets a bar, you know, I have a personal challenge with myself, not just get over the bar, but let's see how, how high I can actually get over that bar. You know, I, I really get competitive with my own self. And my peer at the time, Timothy Baldridge, not knowing this personality flaw, said to me, well, clearly, Paul, you're going to do data-described clients, right? That's the very logical thing that you would do next. And you know, I took a deep breath, and I said, yep, we're going to do data-described clients. And uh, so we did data-described clients. But if I was going to build a data-described client tool, if I was going to build an application with this technique on the client side for consumer reports, I didn't want to build just any application. I wanted to build an application that already existed. I wanted to create a baseline that we could compare the two approaches against. So we would have some idea of the metrics between these approaches. And the client that we actually created is this one right here. It's sort of the Consumer Reports Ratings application. And I want to draw your attention particularly to the table at the bottom where you know there's prices and there's scores and there's some sort of rating mechanism and there's products listed and then there's all these filters on the left hand side and you know I also want to draw your attention to that filter brand you know the filter as you type kind of filter where I type in the name of a brand and it starts doing fuzzy find on all of the brands that match that right so I want to build this application and that application is all of this code right here 26 lines so Using data described clients in only 26 lines, I can rebuild that entire application. And immediately you can see this is a cell oriented application. You know, it's a cell oriented system. So making an application is no more difficult than making a spreadsheet, at least in my opinion. But um, the cells at the very top, they hold the data, and they can hold any kind of data. You know, they can hold immutable data, static data, or they can hold data that they fetched from a, a remote resource, like data they fetched from a server. They can hold data they extracted out of the DOM. They can hold any kind of data. And right underneath that is the UI. And the UI binds those cells to interactions, labels, and displays. And it's completely independent from those cells, completely independent from the data. That binding actually happens with a reader literal. So you're sort of seeing the power of these reader literals again. You know, the, the UI has no notion of the cells above it. It has no notion how the cells are actually being bound. And so I can take one UI from one app and stick it on the cells to another app. Or I can take the cells from that other app and stick it on top of this UI. And that will actually work. All of this sits on top of core async and React.js. It's fully extensible through React components. So I can go ahead and extend and, and reuse the UI by, by creating React components or using other React components. And the cells, that's actually fully extensible through a multi-method. If you need to define a new kind of data source for your, your system, you can extend it through a multi-method. What you end up is, uh, with is complete app reusability. I can reuse any piece of this, from the smallest UI component to the entire UI structure, from the smallest cell or data source to an entire set of cells. I can reuse all of it. And what's particularly impressive is that these 26 lines replaced over 2,000 lines of JavaScript and over 1,000 lines of HTML. 26 lines replaces all of that. And that happens when you start thinking declaratively about your systems. So let's think about some conclusions we can make about doing data-described clients. Well, the first thing that's very obvious is there's no closure script compilation involved. Right? You get this data description, and it turns into an instant application. So they can be loaded as fast as you want. They can be loaded and sent over the wire. They can be read out of local storage. They can be fetched from a CDN. It takes 10 milliseconds to render an entire application. At the rate of 10 milliseconds for a single application, you can start flipping through applications like you would flip through TV channels. You can actually make 30 frames per second of animations of multiple applications all stacked on top of each other. So you can really stretch this metaphor as far as you want. 
but it also means we no longer have to make these gigantic, monolithic, rich client applications. We can start splitting it up into smaller app descriptions and tackle it piece by piece, and then reuse parts of those smaller descriptions across each other. Again, the data description for the client is just data, and it lives as data on the browser. So I can open up a JavaScript console and change that data structure, and I will see the results immediately in the browser. This really speaks to the experimentation or the creation or shaping of an application. I get this instant feedback feeling as I'm creating applications. And that happens because we chose data first. We get all the same benefits from the service side as we do in the app side. This can be versioned, it can be rolled back, it can be cached, all those things sort of apply here. And it can be queried and analyzed just like before. But let's think very carefully about that query piece. Now, we don't have Datomic in ClojureScript. You know, but what do we have? What tools can we use to analyze the structure of a, of a data structure or, or, or query a data structure? We have core logic, right? So we're gonna use core logic. We're gonna build a query system using nothing but core logic. So what would that even look like? The system is already declarative, and now we're going to build a, another declarative, uh, uh, uber declarative, if you will, syntax on top of this using core logic. And that's exactly what we did. We had the cells, we had the UI, and then we introduced variations. And variations use a CSS-like selection engine that's backed by core logic to select different spots of the application and perform updates or transformations at that point. So you no longer have to actually specify uh, you know, the, the exact place in a data structure. You can just express it as some CSS selection. Now you'll see I make a couple of selections of nothing. That selects the entire application, including the variations. So variations could technically modify themselves if you really wanted them to. Here you can see that the variations are named. We have four. There's limit results, limit products, no search, and simple score. And they can be applied however you need them to be applied. They can be combined however you want to combine them. They're completely independent from each other. So I could say, load this description and, and show me that description with the limit results and the no search. In fact, let's see what that actually looks like. So here I am in my JavaScript console at the top. I say refresh the description. I want to refresh the description with something I fetched from the server, slash dev slash varied app dot edn. And I also want to load the following variation. Limit products, simple score, and no search. And the entire application turns into just that. Right, so you remember the application you saw a couple of slides ago? Well, if you load all the variations, you get just that application right there. So this is a very powerful technique to, to check out you know, different pathways or different concepts of an app that you would maybe want to mix and match across. Now I want to change the pace of the talk a little bit. I want to change the direction of the talk. And I want to talk more about the, the project metrics and the how we actually did this and how we worked through the design phase. I think that's helpful for people to hear about. And we'll start with the metrics. So we talked about three projects, right? The, the service properties, the service description, uh, the Datomic import in this application description. Each project was only built by two developers. And each project from the very first initial kickoff to the absolute final deliverable took 16 to 24 days. That includes all of the tests, all of the documentation, all of the code, absolutely everything, 16 to 24 days. We were functionally complete on every single one of these individual projects, 12 to 16 days. And the design time took four to eight days. Now, in Cognitech terms, four to eight days is one to two weeks. And if you look at the last bullet points, you'll see something very interesting. We spent half of our time in design. Half of our time was just imagining that ideal future, just working through the actual design on how the system would actually come together. And once we had that design, it was pretty easy to take that step forward to make it functionally complete. It was just a matter of typing it in. But the, the effort was really on that design. And once we were functionally complete, we could obviously continue to evolve the problem in the solution domain however we needed to. Now this really speaks to, you know, what does it mean to be agile? You know, agile doesn't have to mean take the next ticket off the wall, you know, and implement it, right? In fact, if that was the process we took, I don't think we would have gotten here. I don't think these numbers would exist, and I don't think we would have found these systems. Because in that mentality of, you know, take the ticket off the wall and implement it, you're not afforded the ability to think holistically about the problem. You're forced to actually think about the smallest potential thing right in front of you. And you never see all these other opportunities to play the, the problem domain off of itself. 
You know, agile to me means remove the most risk, deliver the most value, and keep iterating on that. And I really think that's what we did here. Right? We delivered the first project, and Consumer Reports said, this is great, that's a lot of value, you have removed some risk, but now there's more risk in front of us. We need data. And we kept iterating and iterating. And you know, these are pretty impressive numbers for just two people, but we did have some superpowers, right? We had Clojure and Clojure Script and Datomic and Pedestal and, and, and CoreLogic and CoreAsync and all this great stuff. And like any superpower, over time you learn different ways to harness it. And this really calls back to Tim Ewald's keynote from Last Conch. These are simple tools, and it's all about how you apply them, and that's how you get utility out of them. The ways you use those tools are actually motivated by the constraints that are in front of you. They're the constraints that are imposed upon you, the external ones from your problem domain. And they're the constraints that you impose on the solution, the internal constraints. And all of that is extracted with design thinking. There's real power in those constraints. It really helps focus you. Right? It, it helps create the ability. When we said a service could only be five things, we really constrained the solution domain. And there was some, some serious power in doing that. When you combine these superpowers, when you use them together, their effects are multiplied. Right? When you use Clojure and Datomic and Clojure Script together, extra bonus points. But when you start thinking holistically about how they'll play off of each other, how you can use you know, the properties of one to increase the properties of another, their effects become exponential. So it's really about thinking holistically. If you just have drums and bass and guitar, you don't have a song, you have a lot of chaotic noise. And I know that because I've made a lot of chaotic noise in my lifetime. But you know, once they start becoming harmonious, once they start playing together, you have a, a beautiful band or a beautiful song. You know, a good design is holistic in that same sense. So, so what steps did we actually take to be data-driven? How did we actually work through the design? Well, I'm going to give you the exact steps we followed. And they sort of shape up like this. The very first thing is to be exploratory. Really investigate the unknown. No idea is too wild at this point. Right? Really stretch out and explore everything. And as you're doing that, think holistically. How do all of these new ideas that you're exploring play off of each other? How do they complement each other? How do they fit into interesting dichotomies in your problem space? Or how do they match up to interesting pieces in your solution space? Again, the system is more than just the sum of the components. It's really about this harmony. Write it all down. Like I said, we spent half of our time in design. We were writing design docs. You know, we were writing all of this stuff down. And we were just constantly sharing it with each other and reviewing it. And you know, the best thing that we wrote down was the hypothetical use. We were literally living in that ideal future before it even existed. We were writing service descriptors before we had any system that could ever run them or make them work or whatever. You know, we were imagining this ideal future. We were living in it. We are saying, is that an ideal future we would want to live in? Does that actually fix our problems? And we were writing it down, and that's, that's the most important part here. Constrain your design space. Once we were writing it down, we were figuring out, did we write too much? What can we take out? What can we remove? How simple can we make this thing? Really embody the principles of LISP, right? It's all about how simple can you make it and how can you combine it? Accept new barriers to produce a more focused, more expressive, higher quality product. Those new barriers are going to give you that laser focus you need to get the job done right the first time through. And really think critically and slowly. You know, we were really reviewing each other's work, the two developers, myself and, and another developer, we were reviewing each other's work, constantly critiquing each other, coming up with better approaches, or have we ever considered this, or maybe we should go read that paper, or you know, really think critically and think slowly through all of it. You're going to be bouncing through all of these points a lot as you go down this declarative path. And then envision the outcomes and the possibilities. We knew ahead of time, once we had written that ideal usage of the, of the data description for the service, that we could query it. We knew that going in. We knew that we could put it into a database and see how it changed over time. But what we didn't realize is how powerful that, that concept could be, how powerful the query could actually be. You're going to be surprised. But do your best to envision where somebody's going to go next with your system. If you create a system, somebody's going to make the next logical step after it. And it's your job to figure out what that step should be and help guide them in that direction. So really envision these outcomes and possibilities. And if you follow all of these steps, if you do these things, you will unlock data-driven systems. Thank you very much.
There is no time indicator this year for other speakers. Usually we have the Craig and Dara clock of superior uh, timekeeping right about here. We got four minutes. All right, four minutes so I can take some questions. That's actually what I was expecting. So in the front. Sure. Yep. Sure. So his question was, you know, we talked about rich client UIs, and uh, you know, I talked about not doing it in 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 Closure Script, but I used this actual data structure. His point was that, you know, well, Closure is data, right? Closure code is data, and the only reason why you couldn't use just Closure code is because you actually don't have the Closure Script compiler written in Closure Script, but. Uh, so, he, he thinks I'm going to limit my expressibility by forcing people in there. And I am, artificially, right? I constrained on purpose the system, right? I use those constraints to say, it is a cell-oriented system. You can only do this kind of binding. But the way the bindings happen were reader literal. They're fully extensible. So you could go ahead and write any extension you want to the system. The cells could be extended through multi-methods. The actual bindings can be extended through reader literals. And the UI is fully extensible through React components. So it's not actually limited by anybody's imagination. You can think of any system and extend it. But I did purposefully constrain the system to focus people on building simple systems. If you let people have full ex, you know, expressiveness of, of closure script, you're not going to get 26 lines. You're going to get 200 lines. And I know that because it took 200 lines of closure script to write the thing that runs the thing, right? So 200 lines of closure script allows me to write 26 lines of an app description. So it's really about the constraints to be able to focus as far down as you possibly can on building the simplest system while still allowing it to be extensible. He wants to know if I can, approve, if I can prove the assertion, um, if there's any open source stuff. So it was our hope to have this open sourced by the conj. We're still working through some details of that, but hopefully some of this stuff will be open source. But there's lots of literature about, and you know, a lot of books about design that you know, there's a lot of power and constraints. So we took that approach here. Another question. Um, so his question was, have I considered creating a, a UI or an application to create the actual service descriptions now that it's just data management? Um, I did not, only because you know, we're sort of limited. These were proof of concepts to see if these techniques actually work. So for me, my UI creation toolkit is a text editor because it's written in text. But you know, there's no reason why you couldn't create any tool that could generate this data. right? I could even write more closure programs that actually generated this thing, because it is just data. So whether it's a UI or another program, that is the intent, that now that it is just data, anything can generate it. And it, and it can be composed, right? You get all the composability of data as well. OK, actually, that's, that's it. That's our time. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Yep. All right, we've got a 10-minute break before the next speaker.